Good afternoon. As the uh, Provost of the University, I would like to welcome you all um, to uh, this momentous intellectual occasion. Uh, on behalf of the Boazici University community and um, our co-organizers of the event, Istanbul Shahir University, the Italian Institute of Culture, the Italian Council of General, and the Italian Embassy, I'd like to thank you all for being here. Uh, on our 150th anniversary, we feel very honored and privileged to be hosting this event and um, sharing it with the public at large. There are times when uh, introduction speeches are not really needed or they may be redundant. And I believe that this is one such occasion. Uh, whatever one may try to say about the significance of the event or the uh, significance and contributions of the individuals, uh, it is bound to fail miserably. So I'm not going to do that. We will have the rare chance today to listen to two renowned authors, two great minds and intellect engaged in conversation. Before introducing our guest, uh, I would like to make a very brief and mundane announcement. I will ask uh, our friends from press uh, to limit their photographing with flashes uh, once the guests arrive on stage, and I will ask them kindly to be seated in the areas reserved for them. Bir basındaki arkadaşlarımızdan rica edeceğim konuşmalar başladıktan sonra ne olur kendilerini ayrılan bölgede şu alanda ya da arka tarafa geçebilir. Oradan flashsız fotoğraf çekmelerini rica edeceğiz. So, uh, let me briefly introduce our guests. Uh, Professor Umberto Eco, um, Emeritus Professor of Semiotics at Bologna University, has written several novels as well as non-fiction works on topics ranging from aesthetics, mass, mass media, and anthropology, and has received more than two dozen awards uh, for his work and contributions. Orhan Pamuk, a Nobel Prize winner, is a prominent novelist of Istanbul and the world. Uh, he also teaches at Columbia. I might also add that he received an honorary doctorate from Boatich University uh, on, in this very group a couple of years ago. Uh, the moderator, our moderator today is Professor Patrizia Violi, full professor of semiotics at Bologna University Department of Communications. Uh, we thank them all and I'd like to invite them to the stage, please. Self-evident event. 
However, I believe there is also something more, kind of some hidden reasons why this dialogue it's a uh, right, but then why Oran Kamuk and Umberto Eco should really talk together tonight? And I think something they share, which has a lot to do with the topic of today's talk, which is facts, fiction, and history. And in my opinion, the, their common ground lies in the way they both share to look at the relationship between the worlds of fiction and reality. And I, for both, I think, the fictional world of a novel is, in a way, more substantial than real life. They will probably use different words to describe the same thing. I have the feeling that Oran Pamuk would probably use the word authenticity, while Umberto Eco would rather use truth. Umberto Eco wrote a lot of articles on truth and fiction, and he explained in this article that uh, the, the, precisely because a novel is a, an imaginary story uh, that did not take place in the reality, then the statement if a novel are much more true than the historical real fact. That Anna Karenina committed suicide is something more incontest incontestably true than the fact that, uh, you know, Hitler committed suicide. We can always discover, according to Umberto Eco, that some historian find out a new document, and uh, it's, it's found out that Hitler did not commit a suicide and managed to escape to South America, while Anna is forever, without possibility of redemption, condemned to her tragic fate. By the way, uh, it's interesting enough that for both Eco and Pamu, the way they the, the metaphor they used to describe this specific uh, uh, intensity and reality of fictional world is the same, it's the same metaphor, and it's the metaphor of a child at play. I don't know if they have copied each other, I don't think so, but both of them, they say that in reality, the work of the, of the novelist parallel what the child, what a child does when using the, the fictional past sense says I was uh, a princess and you were uh, a king. However, in order to convince you that these two um, writers have really something in common, I will take uh, <coughs> a different, somewhat anomalous point of view, which might seem bizarre at first sight, but I hope it will turn out relevant. And my starting point will be they share a lot for uh, particular discursive representative device, which is the list. List, list of objects in particular. And the list, uh, in list of objects has have a lot to do with uh, ekphrasis. Ekphrasis in its uh, more restricted way, in a sense, is just a description of a work of art. But uh, in a more um, wider, in a wider um, sense, is the, the rhetorical figure that is more capable to produce reality effect. And that opens an interesting question, which is a question about realism, which we might address later in the dialogue. Are these two writers realist or not? Well, we'll see. Echo in his novels includes innumerable lists of uh, uh, objects, uh, uh, of many different things. In the Foucault pendulum, there are endless, sometimes, <laughs> long list of Masonic lodges, of uh, occultist societies, of alchemic elements in the island of the day before, for the people who read it. There are lists of objects in the vessel. I'll keep it short uh, because I don't want to make a list of lists. A book in this book, Istanbul, devotes numerous pages to lists of different things, uh, objects uh, in his own home, people, collection of weird stories, there is a full chapter, uh, you certainly know, about an immense encyclopedia of Reshat Ekram Kochu. Reshat Ekram Kochu. Kochu. Mm -hmm. I did quite right. And uh, which is interesting because it could be really a kind of a visual representation of a theoretical concept where we could develop in a lot of his book, which is the idea of encyclopedia, a theoretical notion. 
but they go indeed went even further because he actually devoted a whole book to the idea of list, a book that in Italian had the title Vertigine della Lista, the Vertigo of the List. Why Vertigo? Why should a list be so vertiginous? And what is a list? Well, a list, of course, is a register, is a catalog of different things, and the list is therefore a form of categorization that helps to categorize and put together different objects or items within the same category. And then, of course, it becomes very interesting to see what the categories really is the object under. Uh, at the first sight, it might appear to be um, uh, sometimes an obsessive device to impose an order in the inherent variability of the world. But things are more complicated than that, because we start at least in principle, open-ended, and they are not circumscribed within a given specific clause form. And indeed, the English title of this book is not the vertigo of the list, it's the infinity of lists. A list can always be extended, because you can always add a new item, and this is why, according to Ego, to echo the list suggests the, the ever open idea of infinite, which is the vertiginous uh, aspect and connotation. In the book of list, echo also shows us example of Wunderkammer, those cabinets of uh, curiosities of the 17th century, which are generally considered the origin of contemporary museum, and that comes out in the Museum of Innocence too, which in a way is also visually a strange <laughs> wunderkammer. So that's another possible... Please tell them it's real, they can go. <laughs> <laughs> you can go, we have to go, because as far as I understand, the museum will be supported by Argentine <laughs> yes. so it's important to go, and it's also wonderful and very <laughs> intense, emotional experience, but I will come back in a second why it's so emotional. Now, this suggests this reciprocal love for the East, suggests to me a different question, maybe a bit uh, bizarre, but uh, are the East also collections? Well, I thought about it, but my answer at the end is no. And uh, I think the reason why this are not collection has a lot to do with the writing and the mystery of being a novelist, but I'll come back to that. A list uh, can be similar to a collection, but it's different because, because a collection always aims at a definite closed form. Uh, the idea of a collection is the collection that is able to assemble all the items of a given series, closing the series. For example, maybe in Turkey it was popular, I think I saw in the Museum of Innocence it was popular in Italy to, well, for kids to make a collection of pictured cards, trading cards. And the point was to reach, to close the seal, to get all the items of the seal. Uh, so the idea of collection is a closed form that allows a total control of a some given world although a very restricted word as cards. That's why a real collector is animated by the passion of possession. He wants to gather objects, not that much for the pleasure of, uh, that the object can, might give him, and I think not necessarily because of the intrinsic value of the object. That would be more kind of a, what the, an investor might do. Now, the pleasure of the collection or the, the, of the collector lies elsewhere in the fact of actually possessing them and hopefully possessing the old series. I think Don Juan is a very good example of a very optimistic collector because he cannot realistically hope to reach the entire set of existing women, but the pleasure for him, as we all know, we well know, is il piacere di porli in lista, the pleasure to put them in a list. Uh, are Eco and Pamuk collectors? Well, I can give you a half a secret, I can tell you half a secret. Eco indeed does collect something, he collects 
ancient books. And he has a very beautiful and also maybe valuable collection that he acquired over many years. However, I'm going to tell you then a more uh, less known secret. He has a very, very bad habit because he reads the book, he collects. <laughs> Even worse, he actually collects the book because it's interesting what is written in the book. He collects the book on topics that are close to him, that he studied, that he's uh, interested. And I don't think a, a real collector should ever love the content of what he collects. I know, or I'm about too little to know if he's a collector, and I can only guess from his work. And of course, I'm referring here to the Museum of Innocence. The entire, uh, <laughs> the entire operation, the novel, the museum, and the catalog. Well, judging from that, of course, all this is, in a way, about collecting. So that could induce the idea that Oran Pamuk is indeed a collector and one of the but worst But Patricia, I can, I can write about collectors, but I may not be a collector I, I, myself. What I, about I, that? I know. I'm just that a Victorica. He might look like one of the worst pieces of collectors, but he is not. And I'm going to I tell you why I don't think he's not. What, is, what does it mean to collect and what is a collector? Well, the, the action of collecting is based on an extremely realistic attitude towards the world. Uh, through possession of objects, we can control reality, and therefore the object has to be authentic. They have to be the real thing. Otherwise, there is no point in collecting things that are not authentic in this realistic way. But in the real Museum of Innocence, there are objects that have been constructed ad hoc. Because uh, Famuk wanted to find some object, he could not find them in the real world. But uh, that was private information. <laughs> no, you go there somewhere. I'm sure I knew even before Now, the main character of Pamuk's novel, from the 
very beginning of his story, he declares why objects are so important. When we uh, point to a hidden moment in our life and say that that was the happiest moment of our life, and that is precisely the beginning of the novel, that happiness has already gone, of course. And we know that now we lost the past, and we never come back. And uh, the awareness that we know which was the, the most, uh, the happiest moment is extremely painful for the last For the now, the only way of doing it that makes the pain bearable is are the objects, objects that conserve the memory of that very moment. And objects that are more faithful to our experience of happiness than we are people, the most uh, as us. Objects are like embodied memory supports that help us remember through our own senses. I emphasize that because I think that senses are very important, both for the man, I guess for the moon, certainly for a person who reads the book and reads it, the museum. And they console us in a way. The authenticity of the object collected by the Malcolm Book derives precisely from this. It lies, it lies not in the belonging to the real world, but rather in the capacity to reconstruct a world. As the book writes in this uh, <coughs> novel lecture, which has been published as the Nineveh Sentimental Novelist, I'm quoting. The sounds, smell, and images of the world we encounter in novels evoke a sensation of authenticity we fail to find in life itself. However, this feeling of authenticity, and this is something that uh, the books points out very clear, gives us a sense of disappointment, us readers, of course, because we know that the wonderful world we have been Okay, I can, that is, uh, <laughs> make it short, there was the <laughs> other question, <laughs> <Sure. laughs> Things on the plan of reality, 
and the novelists, especially, and I don't think so many of the books of their art, uh, <coughs> knows that the only way to propose time and to leave you is to make an imaginary world real by the way of words. Mm -hmm. So I will stop now, and maybe the first question would be exactly starting from this uh, naive and sentimental reader, mm -hmm. novelist, <laughs> that, that the lapses is not a chance, uh, or other book about a naive, naive and sentimental novelist. By the way, for working on any of this uh, writing, and especially the last one, which is Confession of a Young Novelist, about semantic and escaping. Uh, but, uh, so, anyway, so uh, should we start? You, you stress more the naive and sentimental writers, and I think we better stress more the semantic and aesthetic readers. So, we start with uh, you. Uh, um, you're suggesting that we are referring to the same thing. We, um, uh, I agree, perhaps. Uh, um, but um, my title, uh, first, thank you for giving me an opportunity to advertise my book, the least selling book in Turkish, um, The Naive and Sentimental uh, Novelist. Of course, this is based on Friedrich Schiller's famous essay on um, poetry. Uh, uh, um, Friedrich Schiller makes a distinction between, um, in his essay, a long essay, according to Thomas Mann, the greatest essay in German language. We wanted to imitate this bo uh, boat sounds in the museum unsuccessfully, by the way. Uh, 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 um, uh, and he made a distinction between the naive poet and, and according to German uh, literary critics, he is, of course, uh, obsessed with Goethe. And for him, the naive um, poet is Goethe. And with naive, he means someone who is natural, who is not self-possessed and, um, and self-indulgent, in, and who is not, who is mind, is not busy the way he tells his story, the way he writes his, uh, his poem. A naive um, um, poet would talk as if he is not upset about the ethical, political, philosophical consequences of what he or she is saying. Just says, like a child, the truth that comes from perhaps outside. And this distinction is very romantic in the sense that uh, Schiller always wanted to be naive in the sense that you don't organize, plot, uh, manage, develop, explore the potentials of the story. It just comes to you. It just comes to you. In fact, in the book, I also made reference to um, the way um, Coleridge writes about how he wrote his Kubla Han as if he is possessed by something coming from air, a subject that I also explored in my novel, Snow, because the character is Snow. So there is the poet or the writer. And in fact, yes, Umber, uh, I also look at it that way, the reader who is not concerned with the um, techniques, methods, hidden structures, mysteries of what a literary text is, is just writing it. Um, and then there is what Schiller refers to as modern sensibility. Uh, the person who is, um, whose mind is busy with how he is telling a story. In fact, in the, uh, 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 and Schiller doesn't like that. He wants to be natural, naive, and is jealous of Goethe for, be, uh, for just letting the story come out of his mind, so to speak. Um, this di distinction stayed with me for many years. Um, in fact, I used, um, I made a modern one that is, that we all drive cars, right? Most of us, that uh, a modern, uh, uh, the distinction can be applied to car driving. If we are a naive reader, in the end, we just drive a car and, think, and we think something else. Our, we are not self-conscious. Now I'm changing to the fourth gear. We don't say that. We just naturally change as if it comes from God because we have learned it. We are natural with it. While self-possessed um, novelist or poet, and in fact reader, is busy, is always categorizing things, is this right, is it, um, am I self-conscious? I don't want to be self-conscious about my self-consciousness, so forth and so on. 
I argue in, in my um, um, naive and sentimental, um, um, the naive and the sentimental novelist that yes, we both um, write, we novelists write both naively and also sentimentally, saying that, that sometimes, yes, maybe I'm talking, referring to myself, I write, I, uh, I feel, in fact, psychologically, I prepare myself. This should be my naive day. I should write without knowing what it's all about the poetic sections of my book. And I really uh, uh, postpone writing execution of that chapter when I'm in a more manic and uh, narcissistic mood. While in other moods, in the sentimental mood, I edit out, calculate, um, calculate the effect on the reader. And here I am very guilty. I am, uh, I am calculating everything. And what I do then, um, um, uh, I hope that what I do then is not transparent. In the book, in this book, which were delivered as Norton Lectures, which Umberto did some years before me, I put everything that I have lived and experienced as a novelist and, and making it sure that a novelist, and a read, both the novelist and the novel reader has two qualities in his or her mind that we simultaneously think, uh, read, or write naively and sentimentally. At least um, um, uh, one part of it is sometimes completely naive uh, as a reader or as a writer, but then there is the other side of us taking care. Uh, and also, I also warn uh, uh, the um, uh, writers to, be keep away, to keep away from completely naive readers who believe everything, who, say, who think that you are, you, this, your book is autobiographical, and completely sentimental readers who are so self-conscious and cynical that only see the structures or the uh, bones of the story. Um, more or less, this is a um, little summary of my thoughts on the whole huge subject. Yes, uh, Patricia uh, put forth uh, at least uh, three main themes. Uh, one is uh, fiction and reality, the other is least, and the third one is naive and sentimental. So let now tackle with the, 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 third, the third one. Uh, yes, in another way, I was uh, uh, concerned with uh, these two level possibilities of reading a text, more from the point of view of the reader than for the point of view of the author. And to uh, explain it better, or at least to explain better my point of view, as an homage to Istanbul, uh, to the Vera Palace, I will, I will make an example from a book of Agatha Christie, uh, The Murder of Roger Croyd. You know, that is a very peculiar a story in which the reader, as every reader of a detection novel, want to know who is, who is the culprit, who is the, the, the guilty one. At, at the end, wow, says it's you, and you is the narrator. The, the, the guilty one is the one who is telling the story. So the, uh, call it naive or first level reader, is taken by this uh, sudden revelation. It's, uh, bouleversé completely, but the uh, narrator says that I was not lying. If you reread attentively my story, you will see that I confessed everything. Simply, you didn't pay attention, because at that point I said, I made exactly what I had to do. It, it, it was the, 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 assass the, the, the crime, I committed the crime, so I said it. And the reader is obliged to climb upon the second level and to reread the novel to see how the plot was organized, how the style was uh, concocted, so to, so to provoke this uncertainty uh, by, by concealing the truth that was so open, uh, uh, open uh, given in an open way uh, to the reader. And that was the second level uh, reading uh, that uh, concerns not so much the surprise of the discovery of the criminal story, but the aesthetic appreciation of the skill of, of the author. Or uh, both uh, Oran and me, in different situations, we have been uh, 
uh, fasc fascinated by the problem why people weeps uh, about the fate of Anna Karenin, and I think that he's preparing a new course in New York uh, uh, I, about... No, I, uh, I, uh, I, I told you that uh, I teach Anna Karenina in my class, uh, uh, but we are not worried that she's crying, by Umberto. We eh? take it natural. Uh, 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 we are not sorry that she's dead, or we are not crying. Uh, we are, or if uh, we cry, anyway, we take it naturally. The real problem is why are we crying or weeping about a character that you positively know it's a fictional, he doesn't exist. Uh, I come back to the, to the double uh, level of, of reading and I call uh, the, uh, the authority of, of, a, of a colleague of us that uh, you know even uh, Oran likes uh, very much, Aristotle. Mm -hmm. uh, and Aristotle speaks of catharsis, you know, at the end of the tragedy, you are suffering pity and terror as the uh, character do and you participate in their, in their passion. But there are two possible interpretations of catharsis. The one is the homeopathic one. You are really suffering the passions of the character. So I, like in a, in a sort of, uh, of um, voodoo of uh, candomblé, uh, or trans, uh, and you are. Re and I think that it was the real uh, idea of Aristotle. The catharsis was a profound emotional involvement, more in order to purify ourselves. But there is also the allopathic interpretation that it is not excluded by the the text of Aristotle. The passions are represented in such a way that you can keep a distance from them. And you are not suffering them, but you are looking at them. And then it is a second level uh, reading. So you can be a naive reader of Anna Karenina and to weep. When you become a second level <coughs> reader, you, you don't cry any, any longer, but you admire the way in which the author succeeded in making you to cry. But on the other hand, sir. I argue, Umberto, that, that, uh, um, that these, uh, our minds, we have, our minds are constituted in, in such a way that, that we are aware of the first level. We find it so funny and to be naive, wow, look at these readers and crying at Anna Karenina, they're, they're naive readers. And we keep this information we make a, a sort of a Pierre Bourdieu kind of distinction. We are, you know, sophisticated readers. We don't cry at Anna Karenina. We also, we only want to understand why others are crying at, at Anna Karenina's death. But on the other hand, I argue that the art of the novel works on human mind's capacity to, uh, to sustain, and for quite a long time, contra contradictory Thoughts and sentiments both, simultaneously. Both. When we read a novel, we do, our minds do so many things. But when, when if uh, you know, we check the reality of the thing, or we are sometimes jealous. Oh, what a creative writer this Umberto is! Then we are also worried about what, uh, what is this all about? What is this book about? You know, uh, Borges wrote an introduction to Herman Melville's Moby Dick, and he says, at the beginning, you think this is a realistic novel. Then you think this is a Dostoevsky novel. Then you think, oh, this is a novel about cosmo the nature of cosmos, what's happening, what life is all about. Um, uh, uh, I argue that we do many things, and our minds are capable of um, um, developing these sentiments simultaneously. One part of our mind is uh, making fun of the naive reader who is crying and crying. And then another part of our is trying to hide that we are also involved in these sentiments. I argue that the art of the novel, which marginalized all forms of literature in the last 100, 150 years, its power is based on uh, um, this unique particularity that it addresses human mind's capacity to generate different sentiments, different logical thoughts that contradict each other. We, more or less, our attitude when we um, read a novel is to accept the reality of, let's say, Rabelaisian, Bakhtinian, uh, many, many, many voices, for, uh, um, and we give our sentiments, open our tentacles to the reality of the fiction. 
And then, yes. Mm -hmm. No, uh, since uh, I am convinced that the majority of people in this world are stupid, uh, <laughs> which is a, is a very <laughs> It's a very important feeling to have in order to be ready to die, you know. <laughs> when in the moment of my death I am convinced that the uh, totality of, of people are stupid, uh, I can die. Uh, so uh, step by step every day you have to, to, to increase in your conviction that uh, your, your neighbors are, are stupid. But since let me, uh, at, the, at this moment of my life I think that, that only the 50% of that. So the, we have two kinds of stupids. Uh, one, they are uh, aesthetically, intellectually stupid, who believes that the only possible reading is the second level one. Yes. And they don't understand mm. people that cry, yes. so, mm -hmm. and they are stupid. Okay. And, but mm -hmm. to read aesthetically a book or to watch aesthetically a film, you have to participate also the first level yes. uh, mm -hmm. uh, emotions. Mm -hmm. There was a, 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 a friend of mine who said every time in a, in, a, in a movie I see a flag to float independently of the nation, I cry. That's a, that's a, <laughs> and I, uh, I followed many, many friends of my very cynical intellectuals that at the end of Cyrano de Bergerac they were crying. You can be as cynical as you want, but um, Rostand uh, produced his machine in order to make you cry at the end. And, you cry. and if you don't cry, you are not able to, to aesthetically uh, evaluate. Uh, that. So there is the high level stupid who wants to, to, to <laughs> co cultivate only the aesthetic level, and the lower level uh, stupid who follows only the ones you know. One, they know who is the culprit, okay, they close the, the book. Or they believe that uh, uh, Kemal is but more Umberto, right. But I need so. novels to be stupid sometimes. Eh? Oh yes, we need it mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, but mm -hmm. we are smart enough yes. to... I to, to ask you <laughs> something like this. Okay, uh, the naive reader is naive and so he assumes that you are Kemal and asks you, uh, uh, you are Kemal and you say, ha ha ha, you mm -hmm. was naive. No, you but can't say ha ha ha. You have to say yes, but yes, don't tell anyone. Because you go <laughs> play quite heavily on uh -huh. this confusion. Yes. You play Look, I heavily. think, I yeah. argue that writing novels is deliberately investing in this distinction. You know that they will say, is Kemal, are you Kemal? And you know how many times you make it sure that this is a novel, this is artificial, I'm not Kemal. Again, they will, you want them to, uh, to believe that you are Kemal. You want them to believe that you are Kemal, although you also know how your novel operates in the second uh, level. But you have continually to provide cues in order to encourage them to understand that you are not Kemal. Yes, sure. And you, and you are lying, and you are lying. So you, you have to... to yes, to that's treat. also cheating. To, that's to cheat, to yeah. cheat. That's Every. cheating. That is meta-narrative. Meta guarantee yourself against the critics. <laughs> well, Bertolito did something very cheating in his autobiographic novel, uh, The Mysterious Flame of... Uh, which is King not autobiographical, but not his own. Eh? Which is but, not autobiographical. But Lisa, you're telling all the secrets. But I'm telling the secret. Uh, the book is full of list of objects, and the objects are almost all represented with uh, images. With, uh, and I have all of them at home. <laughs> Without paying for a museum. <laughs> I collected them from my childhood. <laughs> and uh, you could open a museum. But there is one photograph. The one photograph that the main character looks of himself as a child. And this photo is a real photo of Humberto as a child, but nobody can nobody knows that. The reader does not know. So you, of course, not, you are not assuming that this is a uh, shared knowledge of the reader, but if you choose that picture, that means something. I mean, you play in a kind of uh, subtle I didn't way. have any other photo. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I, I had to be uh, emotionally excited in order to... Uh, there are people who take mescaline or... Uh, Heroin and I have a photograph. Okay, but let's now shift to the 
aesthetic and sophisticated reader and thus a more technical uh, literary technique. Uh, how do you, do you both work with the question of point of view? You devoted quite a lot of thought of point of view in your book. One, somebody asks you, what is your identification? Maybe, imagine, maybe it was just a naive question, but uh, you said with the adverbs, which is an interesting way also at a more uh, sophisticated uh, aesthetic level, because that means something about the construction of a point of view. So, could you okay. explain? Um, I think that uh, in the development of art of the Latin novel, in the 150, um, now um, almost 160, 70 years, um, maybe let, uh, let me put this information, my point about the development of art of the novel. I think humanity had found the art of the novel, what we, use, what we read today as novels, uh, 160, uh, uh, the generation of Balzac Dickens, I think, they formed uh, in, in 1850s what we today use as, um, as a novel. And I think the main, really, um, crucial development in 160 years is clarified by Henry James in his introduction to his novels. So, um, he was keen on point of view. Now, let me just, um, as if I am in Colombia, uh, tell briefly what this is all about, that we read a story, but who's talking here? Who is describing objects? What's happening here? Uh, Henry James suggested that in his books, he always described the scene from someone, some character in the story's point of view. This was not a cathartic, uh, something uh, 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 maneuvered to uh, reach catharsis, but this was something he uh, thought will um, put his story a shape. In fact, in his, one of his introductions, he says, I had the story, but I was thinking, for whose eyes, I'm sorry, uh, for who, from whose point of view I should tell the story? He, he was perhaps a bit posing how he developed the idea of that particular novel. Uh, um, that once Henry James was self-conscious about point of view, then I think um, um, a theoretician in 1920s, 30s, I may be mistaken, Percy Lubbock, I may, I may be Percy Lubbock, craft of fiction. Uh, and there he get, wrote a masterful work say, highlighting uh, Henry James. Um, and, and after that, and say, if you read Simone de Beauvoir's memoirs, how she wrote one of her books, oh, Sartre and I talked about that everything should be written from the point of view, one personage or whatever. Um, uh, then later, and I am one of them, um, uh, say, inner monologue, uh, stream of consciousness, telling the story as in Rashomon, or Sound and Fury, or as in, or as in My Name is Red, and many, many, many other books, telling the story from the points of view of various characters, and even as I did in my name is that through the point of view of the objects, then orchestrating the whole narrative through the organization of the point of view, these are the issues that developed, contributed to the development of the art of the novel. I think point of view is crucial. That, may I add something, or shall we come back? Uh, that is um, point, uh, the, enlargement or um, uh, 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 putting the subject and technical subject of point of view on a pedestal, also uh, harmonious with the spirit, if, if you use the term right, spirit of the art of the novel, because uh, in the end, novels work because authors, writers do their best to identify with their characters. They may be autobiographical characters that it's easy to identify. Then we write in such a manner that they are not autobiographical. We say, uh, just because I'm wearing a red sweater doesn't mean I'm Umberto Eco. Uh, so we change the color of the sweater. We do this and hide and write about ourselves in, um, in technically disguising ourselves. Or we do our best to identify uh, people who are not like us, by sex, by class, by culture, but there are also limits to that. It's a cliche, eternal question of, you know, art of the writing. How do you, you're not a woman, how can you write the birth pains of a woman, you know? And then uh, you say, well, I didn't experience that I'm man, but, you know, I'm a very careful researcher, I research and try to see that from, through uh, uh, a person giving birth from 
the woman's point of view. So um, point of view, um, um, for me, for the development of my idea of the novel and for the history of the novel is, as you know, Umberto, very important. Certainly, and since uh, both of us have been charged to be postmodern, uh, oh, don't tell anyone. Though, I just even just though I don't know exactly what does it mean, but in any case, <laughs> we, we do are uh, postmodern. Uh, I think that uh, postmodern literature starts exactly with the uh, development of this idea of the multiple points of view, and the masterpiece is the chapter 18 uh, of Ulysses. In which the same it, scene it also is, is Tristram Shandy. Seen, seen uh, but Tristram Shandy too, <laughs> but is, is seen from 18 uh, different points of view. But I would say that another feature of this development of, of novel, but you have practically uh, dealt with it, is uh, meta narrativity, the, the way in which uh, the narrator, uh, so to speak, speaks of the novel. <coughs> He or she is on the verge of, of, of writing. Uh, he reaches the, 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 the narcissistic exaggeration of putting himself as a character of his last uh, uh, novel. Okay. But you can have also a nar meta narrative intrusion at the level of uh, language and style. I had an experience of this kind when writing The Island of the Day Before that uh, takes place in the 17th century. And so I, I was obliged to adopt, or at least to make the characters to speak in a Baroque way. But I couldn't stand their Baroque style. I am not writing in Baroque, but they were speaking in Baroque. And so I was continuously obliged so to speak, to apologize with my reader. And, um, try to understand he's speaking like that. Uh, it, it happens. And this is another way to establish this continuous dialogue between the author, the narrator, the author, the author with the narrator, the narrator with the characters, and the narrator characters and the author with the reader, uh, which is typical of uh, after Henry James. Yes, uh, uh, after modernity, you know, the, uh, which they say sometimes post-modernity. Also, it is also related, I think, to over-anxiety of writers uh, um, who are burdened with the tradition of 19th century novel. Um, so it's not classy, it's not highbrow to write another Zola, uh, Zola uh, novel in the form of 19th century Zola fiction. So you have to experiment to be prestigious or you have to find new ways of telling stories and then um, that's uh, and um, one part of it is also related to the fact that art of the novel when it started it was you know, the common perception that it's something that the maids uh, novels are for the maids for lower classes for people who are not very well educated then the statue of the uh, art or the statue of the novels went up now it's yes we have all these subgenres but the literary novel is distinction now it's high bro and the literary novels should prove himself, herself, to be uh, making acrobatics um, uh, about the ways of telling a story. And not only that, also showing his self-consciousness towards the critics and towards the readers, because the readers of literary novels are mostly intellectuals, students who are well informed. We are not writing pink novels, but we are um, busy writing literary novels. Um, so all the levels that you described in your wonderful theoretical books, um, we writers, naive writers, should be also aware of it so that uh, clever readers like you would not accuse of our, uh, ourselves being to be naive. So that's all. there is also that kind of playfulness. Another thing, since I write history, maybe we'll, we'll go to that uh, further, that when you write a historical novel, you know that there should be, uh, uh, that you want to let the reader know that you are well aware of the artificiality of the whole thing. In fact, um, um, what Bertolt Brecht taught us, uh, uh, more or less, uh, the epic theater is what I'm doing in my novels, that there's always a character talking to the reader, a narcissistic me or a, or a loud narcissistic character talking to the reader, saying that this is artificial. Uh, but uh, it, I think in my novels it has two purposes. 
when warning the reader, uh, you know, just be smart, this is artificial world, but I am like a trickster showing you my tricks. And as you try to learn, I do another one, you're confused and you follow, and I like that. And Umberto does it very well too. I would like to, to, to come to the problem of lists. Oh, okay. oh. Uh, no, just uh, to finish this topic, I think, yes, I, in my opinion, you are postmodernist precisely because of this self reflective awareness that nobody can not to have, I think, nowadays. Uh, just before the list, I wanted to ask you something uh, to Umberto about uh, history. I mean, uh, he's a historical novel. Would you consider most of your novel historical novels, or would you define them somewhere else? No. <coughs> Some of my novels, like uh, The Name of the Rose and Baudolin, are historical novels, and even the Prague Cemetery, since it takes place in the in the last in the last in the nineteenth uh, century, is historical novel. Why? Well, because I like that. Uh, and probably also because I don't want to, mm, to become too much uh, emotionally involved in what I am telling, and so I prefer to speak of something which is far from me. Uh, is, a, is a sort that I could never tell a love story as he, uh, as he did with uh, Fuzung, uh, because I, I, am, I am afraid of telling something very, very private. And so I prefer I to speak of Napoleon. Mm -hmm. huh? Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it's due to racial reasons, you know. But I'm it's fiction, in Umberto. We are it's people. It's fiction. Huh? It's fiction. You can you can use fiction as a shield. Uh, it's not only that. Uh, you know that the, the Pope uh, has bo uh, the family of the new Pope has born. Uh, in, in a village in Piedmont, uh, my region. It seems that they arrived there, 50 cameras with journalists and found the, the old uh, descendant of the family. Uh, and they said, it's true that you are the only cousin of the Pope. He said, oh, no. Uh, but it's true that your family has been also in touch with the family. Oh, no. And that was all, that was all. They were, they were unable to express uh, personal uh, feelings, so they have defeated the, the, pre the entire press uh, by, by refusing to give an answer. So, so that if they had to tell a story, they would write an historical, an historical novel. Uh, yes. You want well, to uh, 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 Umberto, your answer looks like those people who say, oh, I never read novels because they're all imaginary and personal. Um, um, uh, I think that, in fact, that novels are invented to tell personal stories disguised as objective, disguised, disguised as objective. Um, I think you can go, uh, I think you can tell every, every private thing and attribute to uh, um, uh, um, your characters. In fact, I also, uh, the problem with writing novel, uh, the problem for me in writing novels that I cannot find anything that's not personal in it. Uh, uh, but of course, uh, I do my best to hide my personal sentiments. Um, and I argue in this book that, um, in fact, the, what the novelist's signature is about personal sensations. Say we read Hemingway, he is so good in giving us a sensation how it feels when you uh, drink a coffee. Uh, how, how, we, how it feels when you wake up in the morning and walk in the empty streets and feel, the, say, the, sound, uh, the smell of the early morning rain in a spring day, then you think you like the novelist because of these very particular uh, sensations, which I argue in this book uh, constitute the signature of the author, whether it's a historical novel or whether it's a science fiction story, doesn't really, uh, is not uh, very important. In the end, even if you write a historical novel or a science fiction, you t uh, the writer with a signature like you always talks about himself. Okay, I have not said that I don't put personal feelings or Thank memories you. in my novel. I say that I conceal them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Eh? Mm -hmm. And once uh, I, I was asked what is the most uh, autobiographical aspect of your novel, and I answer the adverbs. 
which is which is which is very poor. Well, probably the, diff the main no. difference is the level of consumer. Yes, you, yes. He consumes mm. much more yeah. than you yes. do. <clears throat> but about sensations, I think there is a difference in here because. Uh, the, the way you describe and use objects, let alone the real museum, that is very much linked to this reproducing the, the sensation, the words yes. of sensation and mm -hmm. perception. Why, for you, list and object, I don't know, they have, it seems to me, quite a different uh, touch. Oh, uh, okay, I agree with what you have said about uh, lists, in general, the difference between lists and, and collection. Uh, I know many collectors that when they have finished to, 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 to perform their collection, they don't need anything, that they sell the collection because they are <laughs> no more interested uh, in and they start an, a new collection or something of uh, something else. While in list uh, there is uh, the possible infinity, it's not by chance that in the museum of Oran, there are empty doors. Eh? So he wants to continue for some decades uh, more. Uh, but, uh, and uh, I think that we both, we had some observations uh, about the, the first example of list in Homer, uh, in which on one side you have the shield of Achilles, which is the description of a perfect and accomplished form. Uh, because he knew exactly what uh, it had to be represented. And then when he wanted to represent the immensity of the Greek army from the point of view of Trojans, he made the list, the list of the ships, uh, you know, because he was incapable to give a form to what was happening. Okay, and that is really the reason why we make list, because we feel impossible in this moment to give, a, to, gi to give a final form to what you call the instance of time, uh, to, to finish the, the entire... Uh, the entire infinity, you mean. Infinity. Infinity. Mm. But there is another re reason. You didn't mention, and uh, people doesn't mention, I want to know if Oran thinks so, is the musicality. I think that you read sometimes some of your list, uh, in order to, to listen the, the music, yes. the music which is the variation, the music which is the riff in jazz, the music which is a certain rhythm of a list, and sometimes you write lists only because of their sound. Okay, um, we novelists use, and I'm, Umberto and I are the kind of novelists who are occupied with this. There are so many reasons for that. Um, First, perhaps because of our education, we are, um, that for me, uh, uh, that going to school is memorizing some lists. Uh, Turkey cities, um, uh, capitals of uh, the countries. The, they, football, the uh, football team. Uh, foot, yeah, uh, um, this was edu education. Then, as with, uh, with my brother, we used to uh, collect, as I uh, exhibited some of them, um, uh, if, uh, pictures of footballers or movie stars and they were numbered and you have to uh, collect hundred of them. Uh, lists are essential for the kind of novelist, but uh, I am and uh, Umberto is, uh, uh, the pers uh, there are personal motivations, but then there is a very humane uh, side in me that which Umberto refers to as uh, poetry of the list that there are the objective infinite lists, you know, you collect, and as a, in fact, I did collect all the matchboxes that Turkish companies produce in the years uh, that covered the Museum of Innocence between 1974 to, uh, 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 to uh, 19, I now forget how, when my book ended, 1983. And they were, and, and I tried to put them in the museum and they didn't look nice. Uh, so I hid them, they are in my home. Uh, here, uh, um, that uh, the desire to exhaust the, all the elements in the list is a, uh, is not uh, is a collector's habit, and it has something to do with possessing the world. In a way, the uh, um, the uh, and this kind of collector is, as you pointed out very cleverly, is always male, 
he wants to possess and control the world, and the world is composed of lists, and a child who is educated by the educational system I had in Turkey looks at the world as lists. The things I want to achieve in life, I still do the novels, I put them together, the, the novels I want to write. You know, I want to write this novel, that novel, this novel, that novel, this novel, how oh, am I going to write all that? Or, as I start to write a novel, um, then I make a list of what are the subjects I actually want to go into. into. I don't write a novel thinking a girl falls in love with a boy, but the boy goes to the military service and something happens. That's not how I look. I look at, I want to talk about this, I want to talk about um, um, blue microphones, I want to talk about this plastic thing, I want to talk about how Hemingway, you know, something like how it feels when you walk early in the morning after the rain, I want to talk about this, I want to talk about my angers, this or that. Then, then I write them down, then I, begin, look, I look at the list and say, okay, now I have to have a story that connects all the Those elements in a, in a list. Uh, the logic of Museum of Innocence as a novel um, is, in fact, it all started with, uh, with uh, the Museum of Innocence as a novel, started with the idea of forming a real museum. Maybe I tell them that there is a real museum, you can come, you know, it's in uh, Chukurjima. Uh, and then making an annotated catalog of that museum in such a way that uh, the annotations are manipulated in such a way that it reads like a novel. Perhaps something in the form, I thought, it would be like Nobako's Pale Fire, which is a commentary, line by line. Also, the influence owes Atai's Tutunat Mayamna. Uh, uh, um, um, that, uh, that if I manage to talk about the objects that my ca uh, character came out, uh, collected, which I was also collecting, uh, then talk about the each uh, uh, object in such a uh, uh, way that the series of objects would form a novel. And here my point is that in the end we can reduce a novel to a structure in which there are things, sentiments, impressions, stories, images, anger, sentiments we want to talk about. But we need, a, uh, we need a, some strong uh, body, a uh, tree to hold on to these wonderful, what Nobako calls nerve endings that constitute a whole. We have a sentiment to put all, all everything together, then we look for a story. In fact, the story never comes, you know, objects suggest that story. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think, well, that was talking of the poetry of Lister uh, in the term of musicality, because I think you have in mind the list of words, even if words refer to I, I have in mind one of the chapters of his yeah. uh, museum, in which uh, in the Italian translation is a volte, a volte, a volte, Baza, sometimes, Baza. My sometimes, is improving sometimes. There are four or five <laughs> pages of this list, and you are not strictly interested on in all the elements that are listed, but on the chant, on, on, the, on the music of these. Uh, yeah, that's, that's why I call it jazz. You're really interested that, also mm -hmm. on the materiality of the object that, that reminds you of the same uh, perceptive experience. I think this relation with the world of senses is Se very, very important in your uh, in your world, in your poetic world. And it seems to me that the the everyday objects can become so important because they are at the same time so everyday but so universal, and then they can reach a kind of collective memory, something that we all share in terms of everyday sensorial experience of the world. That was my impression. Like uh, so, more or less, my museum can, in, in a, uh, simplified in a nutshell, can be summed up that I am exhibiting Proust's Madeleines, but my, I, my Madeleines are in the shape of cigarette butts, my, uh, and a glass, and a salt shaker. Uh, the, uh, the way my character, my protagonist, Kemal, is behaving towards the objects is, in fact, um, although he never confesses that he read Proust, is that he is treating the objects he gathered. I make it clear in my Museum of Innocence that there is a distinction between gathered objects and a collection. And what is the distinction? Gathers ob gathered objects um, uh, reach the level of a collection 
if they are exhibited in a museum with a story. Now once, once I had the gathered objects, I said, wow, so I need a museum and a story. Since I'm a storyteller, that's easy. I wrote the story. The hardest part was to do the museum. But, did, uh, but I also argue in the book that uh, gathering objects is common to human heart every place, but a museum <coughs> with a, uh, that, that a place that exhibits objects with a story, whether it's a national history or a, this is the uh, um, um, fire, uh, fire extinguisher, history of Istanbul fire extinguishers or whatever, that there should be always a story that links the objects. Even if you leave, you know, a, a, a piece of cloth and leave three interesting objects, the human mind looks at them and generates a story that connects these objects. With, um, that I argue in the Museum of Innocence, that, that we link uh, objects that are not familiar with us, uh, you know, with a story, Objects always suggest a story, whether they are gathered objects, uh, but you have to put them on a pedestal, uh, I'm sorry, we have to put them on a pedestal, the pedestal that is called a museum. Well, now, I, now yeah. I think that in a good list, at the first glance, uh, the object should appear as they had no connection with each other, eh? like the, the the, in Borges, uh, the list of Borges, a good list should be made of unconnected objects. But if you read and you read it, that at a certain moment, you discover what you call the secret center, the yes, deep thank you for center so. of, of the book. I make you a, a, a personal example since we are condemned here to speak either of our own books or the other friend books. So <laughs> we have not so many, many other chance except uh, a quotation of Homer. And um, in my Foucault's pendulum, the main character spends at least one night uh, going around to the, to the Conservatoire of Art et Métier in, uh, in Paris uh, and describing unconnected objects uh, because in a museum, objects have no relationship to each other and moreover the objects of a museum of technology are unknown to, to, to the reader, uh, even to the narrator and, uh, and so he describes the forms and forms, uh, why, why? But at the end we uh, finally discover that the secret c core of this list is the conspiration syndrome. Everything is suggesting you a universal conspiration and you understand that this is a story of a paranoid, uh, a paranoid hallucination. And so you have to play about the inconsistency, uh, um, surface uh, inconsistency of the least and the profound deep consistency of the secret core of your story. May I ask you a question, Roberto? Uh, that I am always my uh, um, uh, my friends always accuse me of being a bit paranoid, uh, and my I argue uh, I have two cliche answers that just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean that everyone is following you know bad guys are following me. This is a common joke. But the other the other thing that well shouldn't I be a paranoid because I'm a, I'm a novelist for almost um, um, more than 35 years then an uh, art of the novel is, is, uh, is also has a paranoid side. There is, as I try to prove in my the naive and sentimental novels, there is at the very heart of uh, this structure a secret center and a sort of a meaning emanates secretly, mysteriously from that. When we read, when we read a novel, we're always asking this, Oh, very good observation, what a clever writer, what a good rhetoric, what so forth and so on. And but, but we always say, so but why am I reading this? What's the point? What's the center? What's the meaning? And then this makes us a bit slightly paranoid because we are in a world, someone plotted something for us. We are sentimentally by our sensations in, in, in a world that someone constructed us to feel something. Uh, and then we are nervous if it's a good novel, it's, if it's not um, Agatha Christie, you know, it's not an, if it's not a novel with uh, uh, clues written in italics, um, uh, then we are nervous, where is it, where, where will the dog bark, where will, be, where will the shot come, meaning not necessarily it's killing, but what's the meaning of it, it's beautiful, but what's it all about, 
and that make uh, and then we open our, our tentacles and if you open our tentacles and perceptions too much we get to be a bit paranoid and uh, and writing a novel is also simultaneously identifying with yourself and identifying with the reader so you read your novel you write 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 in a poetic in a very naive way, then you read it again, wow, through the point of view of the reader, then you begin to um, um, plan that this text be paranoid. You are a great expert on paranoid literature. Maybe you'll tell us, clarify the subject better than I. No, I, I think you are not obliged to be, to be paranoid in order to, to tell paranoid stories. Yes. To represent uh, one of my mottos is, Doctor, all the paranoids are persecuting me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I am surrounded by, by paranoid, uh, paranoid uh, people. It doesn't mean that, that I am not uh, paranoid. I am denouncing the, the, the universal uh, existence of the paranoid uh, com uh, plot. <laughs> Well, uh, maybe a uh, close to be the last very naive question. I'm not going to ask you how do you write your novel because I already know the favorite answer of Umberto Eco, which is from left to right. So I'm going to say that to you. But I ask you a slightly different version of the very naive question, which is why did you write novels to begin? Oh, really? Okay. Well, really, uh, that I, re um, I realized I wanted to be a painter between the ages of uh, 7 and 22. Oh, um, I am a, a sort of a black sheep in a family of engineers. Everyone studied engineering, mathematics. I lived in a very competitive family where uncles are uh, catching you in a corner and asking mathematical questions. And I was intimidated by this precision. Uh, one reason, not on the, only that. Uh, then somehow, I, uh, once I drew in, a, uh, uh, in high school or at, at home some drawings and everyone said, my God, this boy has talent. And I loved it. Uh, so I prepared myself for a painter's life uh, till 20. Everyone was like saying that Orhan will be a painter. And since I come from a family of engineers, I went to Istanbul Technical University, uh, at, at least a concession that I'll not, I will not be an engineer, but an architect. Um, uh, and, uh, and it continued like this. But in the end, I thought that I will live a solitary life. I have seen in life that I don't want to get orders from superiors and give order to, for, to people who are below me. I want to live a solitary life of imaginative person. First, I thought it would be a painter. Then, this I explained in my Istanbul autobiographical book, which ends the moment that I decide not to be a painter, but a, no, uh, but a writer, uh, that I realized that, for some reason, I cannot be a painter. Why don't I be a novelist, I said to myself. But maybe, there, maybe that may be a fun life. And the, 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 the day I said I won't be a painter, but I will be a novelist, um, is when I was 22. In the end, uh, most people say, I am, an, uh, I am a writer because I have things to say. It's honestly, the things that I wanted to say came later. I wanted, I wanted to be a writer because I wanted to live alone in a room. And I'm very happy that I managed to do that. Uh, even um, generated some, um, managed to generate the interest of some readers. I'm so happy that you, um, uh, you are even here to listen to us. Mm -hmm. well, an alternative could have been a life prisoner. <laughs> <laughs> Without money, but, yeah, but, uh, you be, but <laughs> of course, it's human vanity. You need some recognition. Okay. You need someone to kiss you and say, Orhan, your painting is nice today. Your, your, your sentence is good. So that's why you also publish and show it to others, which is always damning. No, I have uh, uh, two kinds of, uh, of answers. Uh, one in order to frustrate uh, the, the, the person who asks, 
uh, stupid question because they have to be frustrated and humiliated <laughs> and so I say some people are pedophiles, some of them make bank robberies, some of them climb upon the Mont, Mont Blanc. I write novels. So, uh, <laughs> the, you, we have not discussed the personal preferences of you. But the other one should interest you as a semiotician because you know that, uh, well, according to many, many, many researchers of the last um, decades, uh, we know that every form of knowledge, even definitions, are structured under the form of a narration. So narrativity is not only a category that uh, uh, rules uh, novels uh, and stories, but every, every form of knowledge. And uh, so I practiced narrativity uh, all along my life. Uh, when I was a child, writing stories. And then I discovered that I had no talent for, for, for writing novels and I stopped. But when I, I presented my doctoral uh, dissertation, one of the professors, uh, the one that afterwards published my, 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 my dissertation, so his criticism was a benevolent one, he says, but you know, you are not ripe uh, enough because um, the, the, the real uh, scholar makes a research. And this research involves uh, uh, many, mm, many mm, errors uh, and uh, tri trial and errors. You make an hypothesis, then you refuse it, then you try another hypothesis, and you reach your conclusions. But you are a real scholar. At the end, your book, your dissertation should be the conclusions. On the contrary, you have told the story of your research as it were a detection novel. I recognize that he was true in the, depicting my thesis like that, but he was wrong in believing that it was a flow. I decide that every uh, scholarly research should be uh, constructed and organized as a detection novel. So all along my life, I wrote detection novels uh, um, disguised as philosophical uh, research uh, until the moment uh, I decide, since I had nothing better to do, uh, to write a real detection novel, that was all. Well, I think you are lying, because I can, <laughs> I can absolutely assure you, if you read the theory of semiotics, it's much less fun than the name of your horse, but in the less narrow. Uh, there, there are novels that are not necessarily fun. No, I know. <laughs> I have never fish, finished the, 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 the the Vanity Fair, for instance, <laughs> because I don't find it so fun. <laughs> well, uh, just to maybe to conclude, why don't you ask each other a question? Something wow. you always wanted to know. But we are not. You, I, uh, you didn't tell me that you were going to ask this question yesterday. <laughs> I just okay. Um, that, um, um, this is a, uh, since this is an unprepared uh, question. I'm taking my time to think about it. One part of mine is busy with the, uh, what kind of surprise question I can ask to Umberto. Uh, for example, is it coincidental that the color of this cloth and the color of your sweater is the same? <laughs> I have uh, many interest in color. This uh, is a paranoid question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the fact that uh, 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 the mind that generates uh, uh, a fiction is the mind that finds connection Connect with unconnected things. In fact, a suggestive novel, in the end, is a novel of a person who has the mind of, uh, who is asking irrelevant questions. But if we ask uh, obviously clarified, logically um, amplified uh, uh, questions that has so much reason that the reason puts it on a pedestal, then that's not a uh, then that's not a good novel. But if we write a novel uh, and if, and one part of our body, our spirit, or our mind knows that why we are not why we are not sure why we are writing it, that I always feel uh, is a good novel. Uh, the, um, uh, the question I uh, I should ask to Umberto, uh, I will evade that. But I should make a statement. 
I am so happy he is here. He is a great writer. I am grateful that this uh, conversation is organized that I have learned so much from him. I should express my gratitude to him. He is a great writer, and this had been a great conversation and opportunity for me. Yeah. I cannot. <laughs> I cannot repeat what he said, because it, <laughs> it would be mere plagiarism. <laughs> No, we have not uh, liquidated the, the problem of fiction and reality. Yeah. So you, you, have to organize, you have to organize a new meeting for, for next year. Eh? Okay. Or we have an appointment in Bologna. Yes. Next year. Okay. Next year I'll go to Bologna to do the same kind of thing. Yes. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>